Ever walk into an intellectual bear trap? Someone with just a little more cleverness than you empties the proverbial water out of the pool right before you dive in. Hey man, REO Speedwagon blows fat hog. Yeah, like that. <laughs> so South Park hammered Disney in general and Kathleen Kennedy in particular for pandering to underrepresented groups with their Put a chicken in it, make her gay! And Lucasfilm Disney have released their trailer for Star Wars The Acolyte, which walks right into that intellectual bear trap. Anyone who didn't get what South Park were referring to or believed them to be obsessed with identity politics either gets it by now or just doesn't get anything. The interweb has jumped on Disney for being, well, who they are, and are expressing their opinions on the Disney agenda with the usual nuance of an angry mob. Hey, am I supposed to be using yellow font in my thumbnails? No one told me to use yellow font in my thumbnails. Ah, fuck them. I'm going to leave the whole demographic composition of a ladies' room in an international airport part of the trailer be as much as I can, since there's more than enough reaction videos of burning it to the ground with those torches in hand, and instead express an idea or two about where I think Lucasfilm Disney may have a decent concept with the Acolyte, but will undoubtedly fuck it up, because ideas matter, and their ideas about the world are not grounded in reality. If you're sticking around for that sort of thing, thanks to you. Appreciate your time. Like, subscribe, or don't. Before we get to all that, Disney will likely respond to the negative views with their usual gaslighting, because they're imbeciles. You're no Star Wars fan in my mind. There's no place for racism in this world. Yes, all that looks very off the cuff and believably natural. Nice job, company man. But I'm afraid the gaslighting method only works twice. The concept of gaslighting is to make someone doubt the conclusions they come to of their own accord by suggesting their subjective bias rather than objective observation leading to those conclusions. It works the first time because most people are horrified at the thought of unintentionally being racist, misogynist, homophobic, or whatever, and immediately backtrack just in case whatever they said makes them one of those things by default. But after some time to reflect, people usually come to the conclusion that their opinions are based on fair judgment rather than bias. Correctly or incorrectly, we tend to judge ourselves not guilty if that judgment is ours to render. The gaslighting method works a second time, with greatly reduced effect, because of our natural social inclinations. We know we aren't being hateful because we thought it through after the first name calling, but we're trying to respect that others may have a hypersensitivity to something grounded in experiences we aren't aware of, and we don't want to rub salt in some emotional wounds. We're social animals. By default, we avoid provoking emotional responses in others. Actually, this doesn't work on the second attempt with the assholes of the world. But it doesn't work on a third attempt with anyone, because they realize the passive-aggressive implications of bigotry are just chicken shit labeling, meant to censor ideas that aren't liked and undermine opinions of personal attacks on the speaker, rather than addressing whatever they've spoken. So the mindset shifts to fuck them. Fuck their labels, fuck their feelings, and pass them the salt so I can rub it into my balls and really give these cowards something to cry about. And I'd say that's happening at the moment with Disney in general. Some very clever memes out there. Nicely done. But anyway, getting to it. A trailer tends to have a single sentence of readable text intercut between images or a short voiceover to encapsulate what the movie or show is going to be about, either its basic concept or its underlining theme. In the Acolyte trailer, we saw the usual scattering of Star Wars images with selected dialogue saying little of substance, but establishing there is ethnically diverse space wizards and their colorful laser swords, some mysterious asshole hunting them, and voiceover delivers a message at the end that we have to assume has some significance. This isn't about good or bad. This is about power, and who is allowed to use it. This is a philosophy of might makes right that presents the world through the lens of ruthless power politics, an ends justify means sort of philosophy on human nature. Not bad at all if it's establishing the belief system of the villains. You can work with that in a story. A complete philosophy of human nature has four basic elements. An understanding of the world, an insight into human nature, a diagnosis for what's gone wrong in society, and a prescription for how life ought to be lived. The might makes right mentality provides an understanding that the world is based on power imbalances. There's the oppressor and the oppressed. If you can get what you want, it doesn't matter how you got it. Right and wrong, ethical considerations, or morality of any kind don't enter into the picture. The insight into human nature is that people are forever striving to be the one who holds the upper hand in the power imbalances, and hope to be the oppressor rather than the oppressed. Even concepts like love are presented as a means by which one person creates a power imbalance over another person to dominate them emotionally. The diagnosis for what's wrong in society is either, well, nothing if I'm in charge, or me and mine are on the short end of the power imbalance if I'm not, and the prescription to set things right is I either gain or increase the power I possess to dominate others. This is a good villain mentality. It's amoral, so it has an obvious conflict with any group that subscribes to a notion of right and wrong, and it has some great historical references. Between the world wars of the 20th century, many totalitarian regimes came to power, most notably in Germany and Italy. In a speech on the Lend-Lease Act of 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt neatly encapsulated systems of government based on the might-makes-right philosophy. They you seek to establish systems of government based on the regimentation of all human beings by a handful of individual rulers who have seized power by force, call this a new order. It is not new. And it is not order. 
If Disney is using the general belief system of the access powers from World War II as the value system of the villains and the acolyte, they may tell a halfway decent story about good fighting evil, which a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away worked out pretty well for the original Star Wars trilogy. But Lucasfilm Disney have also shown they subscribe to their own philosophy of human nature that unironically complements what ought to be the villain's perspective. So maybe this isn't the viewpoint of just the villain. Disney's understanding of the world as evidenced by their movies and shows appears to be individual merit is secondary to demographic identity. You get the credit and blame for anything the groups you associate yourself with have done or had done to them throughout actual or imagined human history. Their insight into human nature is that women and minorities are underrepresented groups without perceivable flaws. So the Mary Sue archetype of the strong modern woman isn't as stupid as it is bland. It's real. Really it is. The diagnosis for what's gone wrong in the world is a patriarchy of white men have tricked women and minorities into believing they aren't perfect in order to exploit a power imbalance over them. I kind of have, but stop telling them that. And the prescription for what's to be done to set the world right is to showcase disadvantaged groups in their more appropriate state of stronger, faster, smarter, and without imperfections, to inspire them to some kind of belief about themselves steeped in the narcissism one would expect from a spoiled child who supposedly will do amazing things in the future for which they demand unearned praise today. Miserable little brat. This is the belief system of a douchey niche group, specifically the narcissistic, soulless, corporate social climbers who rationalize their actions by claiming victim status, of which Kathleen Kennedy is a member. So I don't fault her too much for shaping Lucasfilm Disney in her own image. Why wouldn't a pig roll around in shit and mud? But I think recent history has shown there isn't universal appeal in those qualities. Nobody with a realistic concept of themselves believes they're without flaws, regardless of demographic identity. So the Mary Sue archetype rarely makes a meaningful connection with an audience. Ray Palpatine isn't universally hated, but she didn't capture the public imagination like the principal Star Wars characters that came before her. Those of us who exist outside of soulless corporate environments have friends and family we love, and that love isn't a power imbalance letting us dominate over them. It's many things all at once that supports, inspires, complements, and challenges, and sometimes crushes us under its emotional weight. The sum of all human interactions isn't arrived at through the addition and subtraction of power imbalances. People make meaningful interpersonal connections in life, though corporations and corporate lackeys do not. How? I just talked to her. Life isn't just a cutthroat competition of others. Society is a complex interplay of competition and cooperation. You don't win at life by ruthlessly outcompeting everyone at everything. And exploiting power imbalances isn't the only tactical approach by which to achieve that strategic objective if it is on a poorly conceived to-do list. People with focus and drive can be quite inspiring. But when those qualities become overemphasized, as they have for obsessive social climbers, it's usually off-putting. Whether they're in a relentless pursuit for material gain, Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Or attention and adulation. Personally, I tend to be with the poet Edgar Albert Guest on this one. Oh, the thing that I call living isn't gold or fame at all. It's fellowship and sunshine. It's roses by the wall. It's evenings glad of music and a hearth fire that's ablaze, and the joys which come to mortals in a thousand different ways. It is laughter and contentment, and a struggle for a goal. It is everything that's needful, and the shaping of a soul. But hey, that's just me. Ah, what the fuck do I know? I don't know anything. What the fuck you listen to me for? So, has the Acolyte trailer given us the driving motive of the villains setting up a conflict between groups in the Star Wars universe based on the tried and true formula of good versus evil, or have they given us the basic outlook of the showrunners? It's not an unfair question. Disney has clearly gone for a cast that will check all the boxes on their identity politics ticket, but will that extend to pushing their agenda in the plot itself? I have no idea, but it may be in their best interest as a for-profit enterprise to loosen their grip on the social politics agenda. Last year, Jim Brown passed away, and his loss in the black community will be hard to replace. For those unfamiliar with the man, he was an NFL running back who was arguably the most successful ever to play the position, and after retiring from football, he worked in Hollywood with 58 acting credits on his resume, most notably his role in the Dirty Dozen. And he worked extensively in the black community, founding the Black Economic Union and the Mayor I Can Foundation, which work along pragmatic lines in the Booker T. Washington mold of racial advancement through the development of economic self-sufficiency and practical skills, as opposed to the W.E.B. Du Bois focus on transforming social perspectives through showcasing the most talented members of the race. So Jim Brown understood both entertainment and activism better than most. And I'm paraphrasing, but he once commented that you cannot commit yourself to both these things at the same time. Either you can put on the entertainer hat and say to the audience, hope you enjoy the show, or you can put on the activist hat and say to the audience, you're wrong if they don't share your views, or you need to do more if they do share your views. You can't piecemeal these messages together without alienating some segment of the audience and hurting the financial returns of your employer. 
If the idiots at Disney want to entertain general audiences, they have to let go of the idea that it's their privilege to instruct them on social politics, even if they are qualified to do so, which they are not. If you couldn't, you wouldn't. If they just want to entertain niche audiences who share their specific philosophies on society rather than general audiences, they should maybe learn to spend less on their productions, because those philosophies have a limited connection to people's lives, as evidenced by their box office flops and declining Disney Plus subscribers who have lost interest in paying to see the Star Wars, MCU, Pixar, and Disney legacy IPs. How the fuck do you lose viewers with those IPs? Maybe finishing behind Universal Studios, the global box office in calendar year 2023 was an acceptable price to pay for being such a noble champion of liberty and fair dealing. Maybe the acolyte will blast open the floodgates of Disney Plus subscriptions with the strength of a modern woman bending steel. And maybe denial isn't just a river in Africa. Anyway, that's my thought for the day. I'm Dr. Balthazar. Like what you like, don't what you don't. It's all your call, Kimasabi. Take it easy, everyone.